Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly fusion research breakthrough of a podcast from the magazine of Free Minds and Free Markets. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangue Ward. Happy Edward G. Robinson birthday, friends. Howdy. Hey, Matt. Happy Monday. Let us uh, talk about the, the news items. Last Thursday, the Biden administration announced that after nearly 300 days of incarceration in Russia, WNBA star Brittany Griner was finally back coming home to the U.S. The result of a negotiated prisoner exchange with the Ruskies. We got a lady athlete who can dunk but had run afoul of Russian marijuana laws. They received a supervillain sounding character named Victor Bout, a.k.a. the Merchant of death, who was halfway through a 25-year prison sentence for conspiracy to murder Americans. The swap was immediately criticized by Republicans and some others for overpaying and for uh, potentially privileging Griner over 52-year-old former Marine Paul Whelan, who has been in Russia since 2018 on espionage charges. Uh, others have taken the case as an opportunity to talk about America's own sometimes harsh criminal justice system. Catherine, you are a lady who can no longer dunk uh, and also uh, no fan of the carceral state here. Does but the- a big fan of the WNBA. Yes, we know <laughs> Can this. you name a single team in the WNBA, <laughs> Absolutely not. No. Yeah. Okay. There's even one called the Liberty. Oh, yeah. um, that's nice. See, I like liberty. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, where does the uh, the Griner swap get you? Does it get you uh, uh, two uh, Mangu cheers? By the way, cheers? the Russian arms oh, dealer was leading the league in scoring, yeah. leading the WNBA in scoring. Matt, uh, as was pointed out by people funnier yeah. than than you, uh, that uh, <laughs> uh, he, he can shoot better. Uh, <laughs> Catherine, two cheers or three? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it maybe only like one and a half cheers. Oh. I, I don't I don't love just the whole prisoner swap concept in general. Uh, I know that this is a time honored, time tested uh, way that nations interact. And it just makes me want to get rid of nations, frankly, because it's garbage. But yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> I, I am obviously happy to have um, Griner back. I think that um, the fact that the sort of window dressing of this arrest was uh, cannabis possession is um you know it it has definitely um sharpened some of the heightened some of the contradictions uh immunitized our eschaton whichever term you want to use um it's totally ridiculous that she had was facing such a harsh sentence for such a minor crime and of course there are many many people here in the united states similarly suffering i think that's like a very reasonable and good thing to point out um, I want to call a moratorium on calling people merchant of death. Look, I feel like there's a new merchant of death every couple of years in the news. And maybe it's just because there's a lot of death and a lot of people selling it out there. I guess that's a real possibility. But the desire to suddenly really, really care about how bad this dude is only when the the exchange was imminent. Like, I've never heard of this dude before. I read the news. Um, and so it makes me suspicious about um, whether this really was a, you know, tragic undermining of American national security. Nick, uh, uh, speaking of national security, you're old enough to remember you, the name Nick Daniloff. I'm old enough to both remember and forget Nick Daniloff until this morning when I uh, read <laughs> up on him again. <laughs> He's still alive, lives yep. in Paris. Uh, that's great, at least according to Wikipedia, which means it's mm-hmm. true. Uh, how do you rate the uh, Biden performance in a difficult presidential category? Uh, yeah, I think it's great that uh, Brittany Griner is back. And uh, that's kind of the beginning and end of my interest in this. Um, you know, whether or not a Russian merchant of death as opposed to an American merchant of death or a Saudi merchant of death got swapped out is less interesting to me than, you know, Griner was clearly a prop in a, in a you know geopolitical battle, whereas somebody like Paul Whelan, uh, you know, the who's also you know been in prison for a while, it's more complicated because he's accused of espionage and things like that, has a military background, et cetera. I'm not saying he should necessarily be there, but like Griner is an absolute innocent, and I think whatever we do to get her out is good. Peter, are American presidents uh, in an inherently bad negotiating position 
with crappy countries because we place a higher value on the lives of our citizens? Or is that a bedtime story that we tell ourselves in order to sleep? Well, it's not a great negotiating position. I mean, just on the face of it, right? Like it's it's not the position you would wish to be in necessarily, uh, like just from a kind of pure leverage based, you know, uh, uh, calculus. On the other hand, it's the right position to be in because placing a higher value on life is the right is is the right thing to do. And so, in some ways, you put yourself at a at a kind of a disadvantage just on a sort of pure raw exercise of kind of foreign policy power d- negotiating whatever but in the end like you 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 take care of your people and you value them and you uh and you do what you can and like that's that's what matters what matters is that griner is free and back in the United States and that was it, it was worth it and that was the right thing to do i just want to say though that like uh, on the merchant of death question, like is is Catherine okay with the 1997 movie Merchant of Death, starring Michael Pare? Basically, it's a, it's like a, a, oh, a death I, wish so kind of a remake sort of thing. Almost no. certainly not. Merchant no. Princes by Charlie Strauss, the fantasy series. That I am. If okay you're like reiterations, like Lord of War, which starred Nicolas Cage as okay. as a, an international arms dealer who was understood to be a kind of a merchant of death. If we can bring it back to Michael Paré, who is probably best known of the, the title role in Eddie and the Cruisers. Uh, back oh, in my teen mag days, I interviewed Michael Paré, and one of the set questions we would always ask teen faves was like, "What's your best feature?" <laughs> And Michael Paré is so epically kind of intellectually challenged. He said, my arms, <laughs> which the, was kind of uh, great. The tagline like, okay. for the movie version of Merchant of Death should appeal to Catherine because it's built by humans, programmed by computers, the ultimate killing machine. Uh, as long as we're going down a suitor tangent, I think that we can just conclude all of us that the movies that should be uh, preemptively canceled are Merchant Ivory. Oh, okay. uh, no, just, what? Just, uh, I will fight you. Enough well, they're already. Done. There's no your... more Merchant or Ivory. One of them is dead. So I assume you meant true. canceled like culture war canceled, not canceled like not making any more of them, but maybe both. No, I, I think that mean. just you think they're boring and uh, snooty, Matt Welch. Am I correct? Thank you for interpreting my, my pain. My, um, uh, one uh, contribution to uh, hostage discourse is uh, that it's <laughs> hard. Um, Michael Scott Moore is a friend of mine uh, who was uh, kidnapped by Somali pirates for two and a half wow. years. Um, he his reaction to the news while people were making a big big fuss a bit about it and and I can't believe that Brittany Griner has all this privilege etc. Um, he's like, hey, you know what? Uh, this stuff's pretty hard. It's pretty complicated. We should. Um, root for everyone to come home and maybe uh, uh, give each other a break on uh, how this happens. Uh, I think there was a couple of years ago during the, I think it was the Obama administration, when there was a prohibition on families trying to get in and to uh, pay uh, ransoms to either Somali pirates or the Iranian regime, because there's been a series of prisoners, still is, um, uh, uh, Siamak Namazi, I think, is still uh, uh, in Iran, um, uh, held a captive there. And the prohibition on Americans uh, uh, being able to pay ransom, don't like that. We should be able to free to, to do what we want with uh, with our own private Especially uh, uh, when you're not dealing with state actors. You know? Yeah. Uh, and I mean, the, I- the idea that the government knows better about like, oh, you better not incentivize negotiating with terrorists because we never do that except in absolutely every single administration. Um, so, yeah, it's complicated. We should give each other a break and maybe not choose uh, each and every instance of things like this to play stupid two party politics. But we do. Uh, and that's the way we go. Uh, we go through life. All right. Let's move on to the subject that our stupid subcategory of humans Continues to obsess. Is this the Air Bud on movies, and, Matt? I feel like you're gonna take. Not, a, you're just throwing out the playbook, and you're gonna talk about Air Bud. No. <laughs> so Twitter files. Uh, since the last time we gathered around this uh, metaphorically circular table, 
there have been at least three agonizingly long and increasingly indecipherable uh, Twitter threads showing internal documents at the social media company regarding uh, how and when to limit the reach of or sometimes straight up ban various uh, would be users of the service. The first of those three from Barry Weiss showed such behind the scenes classification categories as, and these are verbatim quotes here, trends blacklist. <laughs> they use the word blacklist and search blacklist and do not amplify. The second uh, tranche of Twitter files coming again from Matt Taibbi got into the coordination between the t- between Twitter and the FBI in the run up to permanently banning Donald Trump. Um, and the third by Michael Schellenberger uh, detailed the various ad hoc uh, censorship and rationales thereof exercised um, after the January 6th riots on Capitol Hill. Uh, in the meantime, a new Twitter CEO and former uh, Catherine Mango Ward boyfriend, Elon Musk, has been busy making himself the main character of his own company uh, through a series of edgelordy, rufotastic tweets like, the woke mind virus is either defeated or nothing else matters. Deep thoughts, space dude. Uh, in the spirit of TLDR, which for you fellow olds means too long, didn't read, I think. Um, let's go around the table and each pull one thing that we've learned of interest since last week via these Twitter files. Catherine, do you want to lead us off? Yeah, I think um, the Barry Weiss Twitter file was the best one in the sense that it had the uh, the kind of most substantive evidence of um, government interference here, which is something that I'm always looking out for. Um, you know, there really was a bunch of back and forth between CDC and Twitter execs about what is and isn't allowed on Twitter. Don't love that. Um, but I mostly think that the lesson here is just it's still management and not law for the most part, like the Schellenberger Twitter files in particular. It's Twitter execs just like, making up stuff as they go along. Um, they kind of want to project the aura of having a rule based system while actually operating on an outcomes based system. Um, partially because one of the outcomes they wanted was to be perceived as having a rule based system. Um, it's like the this Supreme is the Court. Same critique that I leveled at originalists last <laughs> week, and uh, some people did not enjoy that. I got some emails about it. Um, you know, this is this is a thing that that happens in a lot of different areas. It's not surprising to see that it happened inside Twitter. Um, it sure does seem chaotic and messy. And so uh, the lesson for me was like, don't. Don't be like Twitter. Um, but actually, the critique was not leveled against originalists specifically, nor am I leveling it against Twitter specifically. But humans, this is how people are. Um, and uh, one one does not like to see it. But this is what is happening underneath the hood in almost every organization, institution and ideology. Peter, you uh, have characterized this in internal Slack channels as a something burger. Why? Well, I do think we have seen evidence that uh, senior people at Twitter were conferring with law enforcement, with federal law enforcement uh, officials, with the FBI and with DHS. Um, uh, it's it's a little bit unclear exactly what was going on, but there are references to weekly and monthly meetings with um, with senior law enforcement officials. Now, that doesn't mean that the senior law enforcement officials were necessarily setting policy, um, but it's there's a there's a very sort of funny and telling little exchange in which one Twitter staffer is sort of uncomfortable with describing their method for deter- making determinations about how all of these you know, judgments, uh, which accounts are going to be uh, sort of blocked or, or restricted or, or whatever. And, and he's like, well, do we really want to call DHS and the FBI experts? Do we really want to like say that that's who we're talking to all the time? I'm paraphrasing here, but that's the gist of it. And they ended up just calling those folks partners, right? And so they're making these decisions in in consultation with partners, right, who are out there. The partners turn out to be um, senior law enforcement officials. I think that the, the bigger takeaway for me, the more general one, is, well, first, just what I said last week, that threads are bad and articles are good because these things are just so hard to follow at this point. The threads keep breaking. It's just very difficult to like quickly go through and see the, see the information. But but that these guys were acting as editors, and they were acting 
they were making decisions based on kind of the information they had. They were like in some ways kind of kind of experts in in the field of like political discourse in the way that that editors are. Um, but they were also just googling stuff sometimes. I mean, there's a there's a screenshot in which one of the senior folks is like, actually, that's true, and then just like posts an NPR link. Like in in the the space of like a couple of minutes, because at that that's how we know stuff is true, and it is. There's no, there's not going to be a way for a company like this to definitively determine. Oh, this is the truth, and this isn't the truth, and we know this, uh, and we don't know that, and you can and like, and there's just there's inevitably going to be editorial judgment exercised in the process of doing that. And that's not necessarily even a bad thing. It's also not necessarily a good thing. It's just an inevitability. I mean, in, in, in the same way that um, that like any news organization that makes choices about how to present information, right? You're selecting a little bit from a press release or from a speech, or you're printing the whole thing. Either way, you're making a choice and you're acting as an editor. And that's what these folks were doing in real time with... Uh, arguably the most influential platform for kind of journalistic and political speech, at least in the United States and maybe um, in the Western world. Nick, you're a fan of transparency uh, and also terrified of boredom. And transgenderism. Uh, where do you, and, uh, uh, but uh, transgender boredom is, yeah. is your sweet uh, spot. The true uh, what, trans boredom you? is, of course, the Neil Young album called Trans, Matt Welch. <laughs> Featuring his 13-minute self-plagiarism, like an Inca, which is essentially Cortez yeah. the Killer set in a different murderous Native American or Mesoamerican empire. I can't believe how much I hate you guys sometimes. Yeah. Would, would you call um, anyone involved in that a merchant of death? Uh, you know, I don't. I think they were giving it away for free in the Incan Empire, so not really merchant. Um, on the topic, Nick. Which is? <laughs> it's just i'm gonna make i'm gonna make you think yeah. of it no i know out the, loud uh, yeah about twitter and the twitter files yeah uh which is rapidly i think there have been as many twitter file threads as there are seasons of doctor who or certainly by the time this comes out in a couple <laughs> hours uh the uh i love the i love seeing the internal decision-making apparatus because it, as you know, both uh, Peter and Catherine have said in uh, different ways, it's clearly results based, you know, it's results oriented. Um, the, you know, the, the big question in a lot of ways, I, and I guess we'll still see some of this of like, why did Trump get a lifetime ban? Um, you know, and that's still to come out. And why did the post story get banned the way that it did? Because I think the New York <clears throat> yeah, the New York post, uh, Hunter Biden story, because a lot of people, uh, you know, and I retweeted Robbie Suave's, I, I thought a, an excellent roundup on uh, the Twitter files number two, um, uh, which was Barry Weiss's uh, talking about the blacklist and things like that. A lot of people were like, look, you know, Twitter said they were doing this all along. So shut the fuck up. Like, why should you be surprised that Twitter was de-emphasizing people and clamping down and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, when you look at the specific examples, and I think the you know the material including are, are related to Jay Bhattacharya, the Stanford medical uh, uh, faculty member and, and economist, a public health guy, it's really interesting because like you don't, there was no way of knowing whether or not you were being put on a blacklist or not. And looking at the specifics of that decision making or that it got done is really interesting. And the one thing, and this is something we should hold Elon Musk to, because we need to be reading all of these through the fact that Elon Musk is leaking documents about a company that he owns, but before he took over. So he, you know, is all of this is interested material and we have to be very critical in reading it in that way. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's not important or interesting, but you know, we, we have to keep that on. Musk over the weekend said that he was working on generating a Twitter tool that will allow people to know if they are being de-amplified or whatever you want to call it and to appeal those decisions. And that's the tool I think that would be great. And I would love to see happen. The thing that I would like to see here that we um, haven't seen is, uh, is, 
totalizing data, comprehensive data, that, you know, not necessarily sort of what we've seen, everything, everything we have seen so far is essentially an anecdote, right? We have seen a bunch of screenshots, stories about this, you know, this meeting happening or this decision happening with this account. But what we haven't seen is anything like, oh, here's just a chart of how many people are being blocked in this way and for what reasons over for what amount of time. We don't have any sort of sense of the scale of it or the, you know, how comprehensive, how frequent this sort of thing was. And I think that that's notable. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that, that they're trying to hide that information from us, but it would put what we are seeing in context in a way that we, we're just not able to right now. Uh, in fact, Peter, building on what you and Nick both just said, um, Jay Bataturia, uh over the weekend, <laughs> stop it. Just stop scoffing in the middle of me I'm pronouncing sorry. people's names Jay wrong. If you pronounce people's names right, Jay we wouldn't have to. Uh, you know, Jay you Bataturia know? Uh, went into Dr. Twitter. Jay. Just call him. He's the real Dr. J. Uh, went into the Twitter headquarters and had a look at his own history and concluded uh, at, you know, at the behest of, uh, of Elon Musk came on in and concluded that um, he was at least uh, throttled, blacklisted from the outset of him joining uh, Twitter. And his theory was that it was because his pinned uh, tweet or information um, uh, was uh, a link to the Great Barrington Declaration, the famous in some uh, circles, I guess, notorious uh, in the circles of Dr. Anthony Fauci, who continues to be resigning. Um, a notorious declaration by a bunch of public health types who simply said uh, way back when that, hey, maybe we should uh, try to protect the olds and let the non-olds and non-six uh, get on with their lives. Um, and for that to be a reason, if it was indeed the reason for him to be blacklisted, is um, is terrible. And it says something bad about the censorious instinct that we've seen, not just on Twitter, uh, but uh, again, uh, to Catherine's point, the after all, it's you and me problem, um, uh, which is that people uh, have this censorious instinct and used it uh, not just uh, in in government, not just in uh, on social media, but even in kind of professional research. Um, uh, John Tierney, Catherine's former boss and friend of the podcast and reason, uh, wrote a pretty, uh, great piece a couple of years ago, just documenting all the different ways that research was stifled, um, and, and researchers who came up with different ideas about the prevailing wisdom about COVID were punished, like they were sanctioned, um, and they had a hard time getting their research published. That's all a dark chapter in where, in a, in a dark glimpse in where we are kind of intellectually in this country. Anyways, Catherine, um, I'm interested in a thing that um, Elon Musk has said, but also Glenn Greenwald has said, Matt Taibbi has said, Tom Fitton has said, so it must be true, which is that the Twitter files show that there has been, quote, election interference, unquote, in uh, the 2020 election, uh, I am a literalist at heart, and this makes me mad. Um, uh, are, can you talk me down from that, or is that as uh, awful as I imagine it to be? No, let's be mad. I think um, I think that uh, you know the idea that um, contributing to, and in some cases, um, you know, squelching and distorting discourse around topics that have political relevance is not the same thing as election interference. Um, and that uh, maintaining those distinctions is important, not least because we don't want to empower um, sitting officials to call election interference on their political foes. That's, a, you know, that's a really, really dangerous precedent. And um, and so we don't want slippage with that terminology. It's not a question of like, well, actually, elections are really complicated things in the modern era. And so maybe everything is election interference. No, absolutely not. Um, we need to we need to keep that category clear because the powerful will exploit uncertainty around that terminology to make elections less free to actually interfere with elections. Um, I don't think Twitter did the right thing to um, throttle. Bhattacharya, I don't think Twitter did the right thing to th throttle the New York Post story, but I also don't think that is the same thing as stuffing a ballot box or, you know, sending out a flyer telling people the wrong election day. 
And uh, preserving the distinction between those two types of behaviors is really important. Peter, one question that all of this, and I know you can't say begs because of other literalists, but a question that it suggests. Raises. Um, raises, thank you, um, is does Twitter actually matter, man? Uh, which is to say everyone's talking about it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but is, uh, we have seen uh, in the past people don't win elections by catering to Twitter. Uh, Twitter is an elite uh, discourse sandbox um, uh, where people act like three-year-olds for the most part. Um, what is your sense of the actual heft and comparative uh, uh, importance of Twitter in this modern world of ours? I think it's... Exactly what you said. It's an elite discourse sandbox. And on the one hand, that makes it quite important because for when it comes to, to politics, when it comes to big business, when it comes to the decisions uh, that shape a lot of people's lives, they are um, you know often made by people who we would consider, you know, uh, very broadly speaking, elites. And um, in particular, journalists and people who deal in knowledge uh, for their business all day long, um, you just go into any newsroom, whether it's a small nonprofit like Reason, whether it's a big, you know, um, for-profit newsroom like the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, and you will see a huge, huge number of screens in which Twitter is open, either in the background or as the main thing. It is. Uh, it's not true of every journalist, but it is simply true that many, many journalists live on Twitter. Which explains some of the other dynamics here. Like it's sort of a, a place and a polity. Uh, it's also like a bar and a club and a hangout space. And so that's why people are mad that Elon took over, right? Like Elon basically uh, bought the the bar that all the journalists <laughs> hang out at all day, and then made himself king of it. And is just like, no, no, the Jameson special. We're not doing that anymore. Now it's only it's only limoncello shots, and people are mad because they like the Jameson they, they like the Jameson special. So obviously, it's important where journalists, where uh, you know, government officials um, hang out, right? And so this is a, a big thing in the White House. The Biden uh, White House has, on the one hand, decided to pay less attention to Twitter than the Trump White House did. Uh, on the other hand, Ron Klain, the chief of staff uh, to to President Biden, appears to spend all day on Twitter. Just follow his feed and you will see just tweets constantly, constantly, constantly throughout the day. And he's the chief of staff to the president of the United States. And so it matters in that way. But Twitter is not a a, a force for mass culture outside of the, the fact that it influences the people who create mass culture and the discourse. It's not something that most people uh, spend a lot of time on. It has a much smaller footprint than other social media companies, even something like Facebook, which is in decline. And so on the one hand, yes, it obviously matters because it, uh, journalists and uh, you know, political actors and information workers matter a lot to our discourse. And on the other hand, it's it just go if you just asked a hundred random people in any city that wasn't DC, New York, LA, or San Francisco, uh, what did you think about what happened on Twitter today? <laughs> they would be like, "What?" <laughs> Whereas if you went to my dog park in my middle class oh, DC God. neighborhood and asked people, "What did you think about what happened on Twitter today?" Well, you wouldn't even need to ask them because when I go to the dog park, they're so, they're all sitting around, watch their dogs play, talking about Twitter. I'm not making this up. That's what it's like to live here. Hey, Catherine, did I just hear a great story assignment for Reason TV? Maybe. Yeah, I'm still hung up on the idea of what it would be like if the entire political and journalistic class just started drinking like a ton of limoncello. <laughs> I think it would be good for it the would nation. Be, I also really I want to see one of those <laughs> I want to see one of those paintings you know where the old democratic presidents or republican presidents are playing pool or horseshoes but it's the bar that Peter yeah. imagined. Yeah. No, with, I mean this uh, is and in fact even like sometimes I have this uh you know this phenomenon where I will like come home at the end of the day and talk to my my husband who is not in is not in journalism and is not in government. He's like not part of those worlds. And uh, I will start to like relate to him what happened on Twitter today. And like 
about half the time I'm like, yeah, this is interesting and important. And about half the time I get a quarter of the way in and I'm like, actually, you know what? Never mind. <laughs> and I think that's about you know, right. Like, so, <laughs> I think it's so where did the... where did Bean Dad fall oh, well, on the on the never mind versus Bean actually Dad really Bean Dad full, started a national conversation. Bean Dad got the full detail treatment, but that is because you know we're in the phase of life where we're still trying to decide whether or not to be Bean Dad. So that was more <laughs> practical application. I'll tell you this: if we lived in a world without cans. Bean Dad wouldn't need to exist, you know, or if they were all pole tops. I think one of the more interesting questions, and this will go to whether or not Elon Musk is just a self-serving sack of shit or a really, you know, tough and interesting boss who might bring Twitter into the next iteration of transparency is seeing, um, you know, whether or not he releases more information about how the Trump administration pressured Twitter. Uh, Because there's some mentions of that and some kind of, you know, uh, uh, ruminations about that or premonitions of that and some of the stuff that's been released. But it's not just, you know, it wasn't just Obama and it wasn't just Biden who is trying to work the refs at at Twitter. And we know that uh, everybody knows this, that uh, Donald Trump and the people around him are the biggest fucking crybabies in the world. Every time anything gets said that is an 150 percent, you know, uncritically positive about uh, uh, Trump, you would get an earful. And I would like to see that. I would like to see, and what kind of agencies, what kind of deep state people were working the refs during the Trump years and things like that. But I think that would be really helpful. All right. Let's leave our limoncello bar slash sandbox and uh, get here quickly to our listener email of the week in a moment. But first... I wanted to let you know that the FTC apparently requires me to read before continuing on with an advertisement. The phrase this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Ain't compliance grand. Friends, we all know probably too well that the holiday season can be one logistical and emotional minefield after another. Family travel, shopping, COVID anxiety, shorter days, colder nights, broken kneecaps. Sure, you could try blundering through the darkness like I do every day, or maybe this year get yourself and your brain a guide to help you navigate the tricky bits. That's where BetterHelp, the world's largest therapy service, comes in. BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists. It's an affordable service, 100% online like Peter, and super flexible. If you don't like your first match, swap them out for another until you find the right fit. Listeners who act now can get 10% off their first month. Just go to betterhelp.com slash roundtable, fill out a brief questionnaire, and find your guide through the looming darkness. That's better, H-E-L-P, like prayer. Go there today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Reminder to send your out loud readable queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one, which if I read the whole thing would double the length of this podcast comes from Jay Linton, who after detailing the razor thin electoral margins of various contests writes, should libertarian, that was a capitalized L candidates throw the election one way or the other in exchange for a public pledge by one or two large party candidates, for example, adopting an official public policy and or naming them to a cabinet position. Obviously, the candidate couldn't force voters to cooperate, but with the large number of libertarians in excess of the number needed, suggest that enough would go along with the scheme to make it work. And of course, no one could prove that it didn't. What do you think? Nick, you've been covering the machinations of the Libertarian Party this year. Uh, What say you? I uh, like what uh, Chase Oliver, uh, the libertarian candidate for Senate in Georgia, did after a runoff, after he forced a runoff by more than covering the spread between uh, uh, Raphael Warnock and um, Herschel Walker, uh, keeping them from getting a clear majority. Uh, He tried to have a conversation with each of them publicly, and then he would make a decision of which, uh, you know, who he would suggest or advise his uh, voters to uh, go for in the runoff election. I think that makes sense. I think if you do it in a very kind of clear cut uh, way with real hardcore specifics and promises from a candidate, that makes a certain amount of sense. I think what Mark Victor, the Senate candidate, the LP Senate candidate in Arizona did 
where he threw in the towel well before the general election and endorsed Blake Masters was doubly wrong. If you, I mean, if you're a candidate and you throw in the towel before the election, uh, you are really undermining the whole legitimacy or the, the reason for a party to exist. So that was bad. And then the discussion he had with Blake Masters was essentially Blake Masters said, you know, for a while in high school, I used uh, human action to keep up one leg of the table in my lab in high school. So uh, Victor was like, yeah, you ought to uh, vote for a guy who, uh, like a couple of weeks before, had said libertarianism doesn't work, who is against immigration, who is against free trade agreements, among many other things, and talks about using the state as a tool of moral instruction and correction. So there's a good way to do this and a bad way to do this. Catherine um, is... Uh, having uh, trying to extract a pledge from a major party candidate, if you are a libertarian or some other minor party candidate, uh, even less uh, useful than voting. Yeah, that was absolutely what I focused on in this question. So I appreciate that you know me so well. Um, th- why in the world would you trust the promises of major party politicians? They are stinky liars who will betray you. And that's what's going to happen here. Hey, Biden delivered most of what he's promised. He's w- certainly working at it. Promises matter. I think that there is, in fact, political science research that suggests that politicians do feel in some sense bound by their promises and try to deliver on them, even if they don't necessarily always. Do I so. think that of all the promises that politicians might, in fact, feel bound by uh, one made to an LP candidate it, <laughs> who then does or doesn't deliver perhaps as many as 60 percent of the LP vote. Since, as we know from other social scientific literature, the libertarian vote does not always swing one way. Uh, those people tend to be divided. I would also just guess that when um, LP candidates throw their their support behind a major party candidate, that more so even than other political minorities, libertarians are like, screw you, you're not my real dad and you can't tell me what to do. Um, so I don't know how many votes they have to command. Um, I just I just don't think this is the way. Like, I understand why this is a question that someone would ask and it's it's a reasonable enough question to ask i think it is what it betrays is sort of a wishing a dream that our system was more like so many other systems where there is, there are more than two parties and that then the parties can form coalitions unfortunately that is not what our system is like and so now and always i think that it makes much more sense to focus on policy and not electoral politics Peter, you live in a libertarian dog park. What say you? Yeah, I mean, it depends. It depends on the candidate. It depends on the pledge. Does um, it depend? And the circumstances. Sure. Candidates, uh, uh, the candidate's a libertarian a, right. party he's talking about. He's not talking about like you. He's well, talking about the like someone like who got the, the candidate, ballot. The LP, the candidate, the LP candidate would be making a deal with and and what they would be promising. But in the main, I think the answer is no. Uh, This is not a deal that is obviously worth making, at least most of the time, Um, if only because I think there's a real risk of undermining what is in some ways the main point, or at least a main point of running as a capital L libertarian. Isn't isn't the point of running as a as an LP candidate to carve out space for something that is truly different, something that is not really even compatible with two party, uh, you know, sort of binary politics orthodoxy as we know it. I, I think the like if you're going to run as a third party, then you should have you should have a, a sense of yourself as being distinct enough that, well, you know that that the other parties aren't the the reason you're a third party is the other parties aren't good enough. And what you say is, well, if if they just did this one thing, they would be. Then doesn't that mean that in some sense you're okay enough? With that, with that party and with its platform, um, if, if like in an I, the LP has many many problems these days, but in an ideal world, it is truly distinct from uh, from Republican Party and the Democratic Party, and this uh, this method of sort of trading, I think, undermines that distinctness, which is part of the sort of at least theoretical value of having a third party. I think that's true. But then you do have the runoff example that I gave, as well as in a a state like California, where only the top two people in an open primary go on to the final election. And if you had an election where it's within spitting distance and the Libertarian Party candidate has done well, they I think they should absolutely apply themselves and and try to stage a discussion 
about a couple of issues that are very important and force the major parties to kind of reckon with, you know, the idea that there is a libertarian vote out there. And that's why I said it depends on the candidate and on the pledge. And if you could get something substantial out of it and actually get that thing rather than just get a campaign trail promise that didn't pay off and was almost certainly uh, not going to pay off and was you know small to begin with, then maybe I could see a circumstance in which I would think that's not a bad idea. I just think in the main, it's not going to work out very well. You think about stuff like the, you know, the tax pledges, right? Which like they weren't irrelevant, but when it came time to chuck those over the side of the boat for political expediency, people did so without a blink of an eye. And so I think, you know, I think concessions to get an appointment somewhere are probably the most promising in some ways, you know, make make me your make me your secretary of transportation or whatever. Um, I don't see, at least at the moment in our political landscape, any LP candidates that are in a place to wield enough power to get a really substantial concession like that. My answer to the question is um, similar to Nick's, uh, which is to say, never do this if you're on the ballot. Um, and should there be a circumstance that the design of the election makes it so that you're not on the ballot um, uh, through otherwise no fault of your own, um, then maybe um, uh, if you can like try to foreground the issue that you were running on um, and you can get uh, some discussion of it, that that could be a worthwhile exercise with the strong caveat of a phrase that OG political blogger and occasional Ann Coulter arm candy, uh, Mickey Kaus, um, used to use uh, cheap dates, which is to say um, there are people who are just looking for a reason to throw their support behind someone because they just kind of like them. Um, so if if he or she uh, mentions the one author that uh, they might have read or whatever, um, you know, there was uh, we had a, a piece and I, uh, I'm blanking on who wrote it for us. Um, uh, not long after Obama got uh, elected, he was supposed to be, you know, the most transparent administration in history. And it was uh, amazing how many transparency type of organizations were total cheap dates when it came to Obama. He just said those words and they thought they won. And they started giving him all the awards for being like sunshine dude of the year and stuff that were all like uh, aspirational, preemptive or congratulating themselves for extracting that really important pledge that he then did nothing. And I mean the opposite of something to do anything about. Um, so don't be a cheap date. Um, if if you're in that unusual position, the George runoff position uh, is an unusual law and the California top two thing is terrible, passed in the name of, of helping third parties, which it obviously has helped quash. Um, so it's a rare case. Um, I think uh, third parties should run uh, elections and candidates and that there's way more libertarian voters, to Catherine's point, than there are um, members of the party. And uh, don't uh, don't assume that you uh, that, that you have those people in the palm of your hand and they can be deployed however you decide to uh, at the last minute of a two party election. And that's the memo. Um, do we have time for a lightning round? Let's do a quick lightning round. Um, uh, uh, last week, uh, Catherine's uh, sexy Arizona girlfriend, uh, Kirsten Cinema Senator, announced that she and her sartorial splendor uh, would be leaving the Democratic Party to become an independent. Um, this will not have any huge implications on the Democrats' slim majority in the world's allegedly greatest deliberative body as she will continue to caucus on Team Dem. Uh, but it did make a lot of people really big mad. Um, so, uh, Catherine, uh, does she still uh, uh, retain your affections? I mean, she's amplified them. She she made me yeah. big happy, obviously. Uh, I, <laughs> I read um, some years back a book um, that was pretty good about um, go. this, this trend of um, kind of the growth of people identifying as independents. And so it's really interesting to see that play out here. Um, I also really, really enjoyed the irony of Bernie Sanders's reaction to her announcement, <laughs> which was basically like, get her ass. Like he was furious. <laughs> at her and um and was like i would strongly consider backing a challenger to her you know, i mean it's like bernie baby like do you not can you not see the letter next to your name like i you know i get it like there's it he's being philosophically consistent to say i back progressive candidates but it 
you know, give a girl a break. Like sometimes you've got to be an independent because your party goes one way and you go the other. And Bernie of all people should appreciate that. Um, I, uh, you know, I continue to have only optimism about Arizona, just general. I mean, that kind of the little square states out there generally um, seem to produce some of America's better politics. And um, and I am delighted that um, that my sexy Arizonian girlfriend is now an independent. Uh, Nick, you've been invoked. What say you? Uh, well, I do think that uh, we were right, Matt, in the Declaration of Independence, how libertarian politics can fix what's wrong with America, that it's just independence everywhere. I mean, I don't know about you. Everywhere I look, I just see a growth in independence. But uh, it's always great uh, whenever a, uh, you know, whenever a politician disaffiliates with a major party. Uh, I would prefer that they become libertarians, even though I'm not a member of the party. But uh, putting that eye there, you know, that's a pronoun I can get behind, Matt, a political pronoun. <laughs> you mean your pronoun isn't prosecute Fauci? I'm so uh, ready for the pronoun discourse yeah, to no, be over. I don't think that's a, uh, that's a gerund maybe yeah. or something. I don't know. Yeah. An adverb. Uh, but, Peter, how does uh, a cinema split your infinitive? I'm just um, glad that uh, uh, there will be more opportunities to reference one of the greatest books I've ever read, The Declaration of Independence. Wow. Uh, no, I actually had a, a, a real question for you, Can we which is- um, Point out, though, the, the real problem with cinema is, is it Kristen or Kirsten? Yeah, it's, it's I never, think it's- You know, I mean, I enough already. Kristen. That's even worse. That's like over. Yeah, over I, I, four. I mean, just I, all hard C names should just be Kathy. All oh. right, Catherine, Kathy- you know, uh, to me, the question is, uh, is, is whether it's, it's cinema or film, uh, uh, cinema or movies. We're just going to start uh, calling Pe her Kristen film. <laughs> Kristen film. Uh, no, but Peter does this not, um, uh, uh, does she then, uh, suck some of the hate from your sexy West Virginia boyfriend, Joe Manchin? Uh, or mm -hmm. how does this, uh, no, thank you how for does that this... phrasing. What? Nothing. Carry on. Yeah. Uh, something, something, Joe Manchin, Peter, go. It depends on how she ends up using her vote, but um, I, I think it's quite possible. She is someone who has already courted the hate of the partisans uh, in the Democratic Party uh, just by refusing to sort of automatically sign on to things that Joe Biden wants her to sign on to. And this suggests that she is going to continue doing that. If so, then I assume that the people whose sort of driving theory of politics is Democrats should do stuff that Democrats want to do determined by top Democrats, cinema, film. Movie lady, she doesn't want to. She doesn't seem particularly inclined to uh, to approach politics that way. And uh, you know, while I'm certain that I will disagree with many of her votes and many of her sort of policy preferences, uh, I I think a less partisan, less party politics driven way of of uh, approaching American politics is is good. And I'm glad to see it um, gaining prominence. If we may, it's also worth pointing out that, you know, every, a lot of the discourse around this was that this was a, a fantastic strategic move by her to kind of stave off a Democratic primary challenge, um, but th which may or may not be true. But, you know, the Republican Party in Arizona is batshit crazy. I mean, they are, you know, they are still behind Carrie Lake, who is nuts um, and is, you know, has little to no reality testing. So it remains to be seen how this affects the Republican Party in Arizona, which could have could have nominated Doug Ducey, one of the most popular and successful two term governors anywhere. But in Arizona history, he would have won against Mark Kelly, you know, easily. And instead, they're stuck with this now. And the Republican Party may go nuts after cinema or film or whatever we want to call her, the big K. Um, and that could shake things up in a way that uh, is unpredictable and kind of interesting. Um, all right, let's go to our end of podcast, what we have been consuming in the cultural arena. Catherine, do you want to lead us off? Yeah, I am reading Wolf Hall, uh, which is uh, the first of a trilogy by Hilary Mantel. Uh, I don't know why I'm so late to these books, which are pretty clearly um, on brand for me. Um, there is a they came out, I think, in 2010 or the first one did. Um, there's a television adaptation that is relatively recent, maybe 
actually 2009. Uh, there's a television adaptation that's pretty recent, so it kind of popped back up into the cultural discourse. A couple of people recommended them to me um, in my uh, still... Also, Mantel recently died quite unexpectedly. Yeah, so there's there's kind of been a little bit of a convergence. Uh, they, they came up as suggestions for Was my... Was a COVID uh, death? Me... Uh, recommendations, but um, they're they're um, you know they're the story of kind of court intrigue. Thomas Cromwell, um, really, really gorgeously written. I am like the ten thousandth person to note this, but uh, English is kind of a cool language, and these books are doing something very interesting <laughs> with English, uh, and um, and just like really, really delightful and immersive to read. Um, recommend them for your Christmas break if you have not already consumed them. I have not yet watched the series, so I can't speak to that, but it also got good reviews. I will Are just note for the record uh, that when oh. Catherine came over and saw Wolf Hall on my shelf, like on my reading stack shelf, she was like, really, dude? Are you going to, you're actually going to do that? This was about three months yeah. ago. I just and I now had she's the wrong it. I had the wrong impression of it. You know, sometimes you just get like I think I must have seen one advertisement for the series uh, and I just thought uh, I thought the wrong thing about these books and I guess that's a, a lesson to not always um you know judge by first appearances. What are the stakes for liberty in the court intrigue or is that a uh, is that a uh, a theme? Is somebody more pro liberty or anti liberty? And I would uh, not say court? that uh, the at least the first in the series lends itself to reading through much of a uh, a libertarian lens, except for insofar as it is a is a portrait of a person grasping for power, um, and not a, a entirely flattering one. Nick, uh, you're a doctor of uh, English literature. What did you uh, consume? Yes, uh, yes, I uh, actually American literature. Whatever, it's, it's I feel in English. English literature is best same. understood as a footnote to American literature. Um, yeah, so uh, I answer the question. Yeah, so I uh, I finished uh, season two of White Lotus, which I highly recommend and may come back to, but I'm going to talk about. Ozzy Wins Inner Circle, which is a magic uh, show that is currently in New York City, uh, and it's reasonably priced, which is a strange thing to say about anything in New York City. But Ozzy Wind is an Israeli-born magician who has worked with people like Penn and & Teller and David Blaine, and he's a master of kind of close-up card magic, which I'm not that big a magician fan. I mean, I, I like Jiffy Pop and The Amazing Blackstone or whoever did that ad. Um, but this is a phenomenal show, and it's a great experience, uh, which is one of the things that I've been into post-COVID, and in terms of art in general, there's a real turn to immersive art or experiential art. And the way that Wynn does this, they created this tiny theater that's really cramped, apparently, they had to. Uh, that's on the NYU campus, and they had to get special... Uh, kind of uh, variances to build a theater in this way because you're really close up on each other because you want to see the hands and what he's doing. And it's just magical. I went with two people who are true magic aficionados and they know all of the card tricks um, and they couldn't figure this out, uh, a couple of the things that he did out. It's really magical and fascinating and it's an intense experience to you know just have your mind blown close up um, so I highly recommend Ozzy Wins Inner Circle. Scour the internet for and YouTube and whatnot for video of him. He's a phenomenal performer, and uh, it's really delightful. All right. Peter, what have you been consuming? I watched The Menu, a smart, mean, funny satire of class and high-end cuisine. Uh, so it's, it's set at a super fancy restaurant on a secluded island that serves only a handful of very wealthy guests each night. It's, uh, it's 12.50 ahead, we are told, um, in the, uh, the opening sequence. So you can imagine how things go with a bunch of rich people and a famous chef played by a very sort of funny and dour Rafe Fiennes and a whole lot of knives and other cutting implements um, and like stuff that makes fire. Uh, and meat. 
Right. And it's the sort of movie that like, uh, you know, is driven by class politics in a way that could have been really irritating and really annoying. But in fact, turns out to be quite clever, uh, just really, really amusing and well executed Um, because the argument it makes, uh, the main idea is not necessarily that it's bad to be rich or that great food is bad. In fact, the movie is very loving about the way it presents the, the food aspects. But instead, it's it's sort of an argument that snobs and aesthetes. Um, and people who are not in into food for the thing itself kind of ruin the art and make it and, and that making it perfect and elevated to the point of joylessness um, is, is is something that sort of takes the soul of it away, both for the people who should be enjoying these creations and for the creators themselves. And so it's a really smart, uh, funny meditation on class and, uh, you know, and, and food and art and like what it means to be an artist and also what it means to be a consumer of art. Um, and it's just a, a much better movie, I think, than I expected watching the trailers, which made it look like it was going to be this very sort of blunt um, uh, and obvious, you know, class food satire. And it's it's a lot it's a, a lot better movie than that a lot smarter film so uh long suffering uh listeners will recall that uh i am engaged constantly a uh, never ending quest to do a couple of things one is to find an appropriate movie for family night um not easy to do in a household such as mine and uh, and also to uh check the boxes off uh, classics that everyone else has seen, and it's ridiculous that I haven't seen it so far. So, in that in mind, can we take a moment to guess? Matt? We know because that's mine. I, I was going to. Oh, I was okay. going to say uh, we can take a moment to guess, uh, Nick. But since you uh, interrupted me, and since Catherine uh, confessed the answer, Blurted I'm just going to go straight into it. Um, so, the Christmas movie that I uh, finally uh, j- checked the box off o- on with the whole family, except for the teenager, because, come on. Um, but she would have loved it, was uh, uh, Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, yeah. Um, it's great, people. It's really more of a Halloween movie, I, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's there's, a, that's there's the an beauty. argument to be made. You can start watching it in October yeah. and watch it straight through the new year if, yeah. for instance, it comes out when you are 13 and it becomes your entire personality for a minute, just hypothetically. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Were you? You were the little. That, uh, so many tumblers locked into place. <laughs> Actual Catherine, tumbler, I think, you. being part of it. Yeah. yeah. Were you Thank batting you your big eyelashes at a metaphorical mm-hmm. Jack? I mean, I had a goth moment. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that lasted thirty wow. years. Yeah. <laughs> I envy you having being able to see that in a formative yeah. moment. That's it was. It was definitely, wonderful. and it's like Tim Burton. It's peak Tim Burton. It's good stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I I don't know that I perceived it as a primarily an eyelash batting activity so much as just like a, a whole a whole aesthetic. If you like that movie, I strongly recommend uh, Guillermo del Toro's new Pinocchio, which is also stop motion and which is like a total like dad heart, like heart wrenching kind of situation with Geppetto and his, his, you know, his, the boy that he carves. Um, But it's like he's reimagined it as being set um, during uh, the first part of the uh, 1900 of the 20th century, sort of as the, like at the dawn of fascism because it's del Toro and it's a movie about how, about how being a parent is good and fascism is bad and it's beautiful. I will watch it, but that sounds uh, like a terrible Matt. How did your uh, daughter enjoy the nightmare before Christmas? Uh, the, uh, the seven year old loved it. The 14 year old again would have loved it because she's starting to get into a Tim Burton phase. Um, and, uh, I loved it too. Uh, for, I know that there are people who haven't seen that movie because when I tweeted about it, uh, Bill Schultz, America's sweetheart, um, said that he also has never seen it. Cause I mean, I, I get why you wouldn't like it's a uh, Tim Burton when that movie came out was kind of, he was, he was, uh, oversaturating the culture a little bit. Um, actually uh, fun fact, not directed by Tim Burton, directed by Henry. Selleck. That's right. There's some controversy about how much Tim Burton deserves credit for that um it is his but uh henry selick or selnick is a really good director in his own um there uh burton apparently had like conceived of this when he was like yeah. Catherine's age when she watched it or something like that um so uh this is a, a definitely a, a a flowering of his uh of his artistic genre but it it, it is also for uh, danny elfman 
Um, that was my uh, big takeaway. In addition, it's just, just gorgeous and it's fun to look at. It doesn't make any sense and it doesn't matter. Um, but that uh, the music is like almost heartfeltedly uh, Elfman-esque. He wrote all the songs. He sings the songs uh, that Jack sings. Um, and as a uh, someone who grew up in Southern California in the 80s, where Oingo Boingo reigned supreme, um, especially playing their Halloween shows that they would play in Orange County. Um, uh, you could tell, like he put, he put all of his heart and soul in the nightmare before Christmas. I haven't seen every Elfman movie because I don't watch Peter Suderman's movies, uh, for the most part. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, it's, it's really great. So, uh, uh, treat yourself if you haven't done it before nightmare before Christmas, you'll be glad you did do it today, etc. Um, okay. Uh, this is <laughs> nothing the... Elfman has ever done will beat his theme for the first Burton Batman, which plays in my head every time I hear the word Batman. Do, 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 do. Oh, yes. uh, okay. Uh, thanks for listening to the Reason Roundtable podcast. Matt, do uh, you want to split a case of limoncello now? <laughs> you think I haven't been hitting it already? I, yeah. I got I got the full compliment right next to me, right next to the uh, the baseball cards and the keyboard. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> listen to all of our podcasts at reason.com slash podcasts, including the Reason interview with Nick Gillespie, which sometimes is held in speakeasy-like fashion. Uh, 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 Nick, do you want to uh, pimp your next speakeasy? Uh, well, I could have pimped the last one, which was about decriminalizing and destigmatizing sex work, Matt, which is up online at reason.com and our YouTube channel. But the next one is January 4th in New York, and it's with Andrew Tatarski, a psychologist and therapist, and Maya Solovis, a journalist and author, talking about harm reduction as it applies to drug policy, addiction counseling and actual use of uh, currently illegal substances. It's going to be fantastic. Go to reason.com slash events, and you can get information on the Reason Speakeasy on January 4th. I won't tell you, as is my custom usually, to uh, go mash the donate button because you did so uh, so vigorously before. We just want to thank you for your participation in the webathon, which was uh, marvelous. Uh, results and uh, and thank you for all this. It uh, helps us do our work, which is really fun and great. Um, all right, we'll get you next week. Thank you uh, and uh, uh, good luck and good night. Mm-hmm.